welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Before you sit down and while you're standing, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray because I want to get right into the word of the Lord today. And uh, I just want you to be ready for it. You know, you haven't come to hear from a man. Never go to church to hear from a man. Never go to church to hear from a woman. Don't go to church to hear from a white man or black man or brown man. Don't ever go to church to hear from a tall man or a short man. You go to church to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. He is the one we have come to hear from. And I want him to fill your heart, prepare your heart for the word of the Lord that God has for you today. So I'm going to get down on my knees and pray, so remain standing if you can. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you. In the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. But Lord, we would ask that you bless us this day. We're grateful. But we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are hearing and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, there are brothers and our sisters, and at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and all the glory go to you. This day be glorified in your houses everywhere. We give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say... Amen. Well, go ahead and greet somebody around you and have a seat. We're happy that you're here. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord today. Is that okay with you? Somebody say yes. Four of you. Let's try it again. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord together today. Is anybody happy about that? Today it's freedom for your future. We're talking about financial freedom as well as any other in every area of our lives. But not only freedom for our future, for our lives, but freedom for our future, for the things of God and for our church and for our families and children. In order for that to happen, there needs to be a heart that's right with the Lord. Just want you to know that all of you that are here today, we want to take a moment and just greet some of you that are here for the first time. Maybe you've never been at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, and then we're going to get right into the word of the Lord. So if you're here for the first time, just put your hand up. We'll give you a little brochure, a little pamphlet. There's some folks right back there. There's some folks up on top all the way to the back. There's some folks right here, back there, back there, back over there, back there, back there. Back over there, another person back over there. God bless you, we're happy to have you. Anybody else in the family rooms, check it out. We're happy inside is a little general information card. You can put your name on, telephone number on there. Drop it in the offering basket, or better yet, meet it at the right-hand side of the foyer. There's coffee, tea, cookies, donuts, wait for you. The pastors will meet you right after church service. We're excited about you coming. We're excited about getting into the word of the Lord. The title of this message, it's if you're ready to get started, I am, Freedom for the Future. God loves you. We've established that last week. This is part number two. God cares about you. And I don't know if you've ever heard a preacher ever tell you the truth, but you'd have to be a theological moron not to look at Scripture and know that God wants to prosper you in every area of your life. He's always tried to get the people in the right position. In order to get prosperity, someone said to me, well, if God loves me, why doesn't he just prosper me? If he prospers you when you're out of sync with God, then you'll stay out of sync with God, and that would be a shame, because you'll think you're okay because he prospered you. When in truth, you and I have got to do things his way, 
his will, his walk. And when you do, all of a sudden, and your heart's attached to what you're doing, God starts to prosper you in many ways. He wants to, in other words, wants to bless you with your every area of your family. Last time we were together, we talked about some the importance and the priority of the Word of God. A lot of times we don't realize how important it is by how many times God talks about this subject. If you'll remember, God speaks in the Old Testament as well as New Testament about your financial future, which, by the way, is God's economic recovery plan for mankind. Let me say it again. God's economic recovery plan for mankind. One more time, it's God's economic recovery plan for mankind. That ought to get every one of your attention. And when we talk about it, we see a priority in the scripture because oftentimes where our heart's at is where our treasure is and our hearts are really fixed on the material things that we have instead of being on him. And therefore, we need to be a people who have our hearts changed. And he knows that oftentimes we're attached to the material things that we have instead of being attached to him. This is not about ministering to you to give money. This is about ministering to you that your heart would be right, that when you give, you give with the right attitude. And when you do that, then you have a great opportunity to receive the blessings of the Lord back. I love to say it like this. Last time we were together, we talked about what it's going to take to honor the Lord. Very important for us to see. But today, I put a subtitle to it, You Call the Shots. What if I made a statement to you today and I said these words, how would you like to call the shots for your financial future? Because you remember, the greater that you manage that which God gives you, the greater amount that God will give to you. If you don't manage it the right way, God's way, not just your way, but God's way, then guess what happens? He'll stop giving to you and it'll dry up. You'll actually bring yourself to a place of being cursed and you don't need that nor do you want that. But what if I said to you, here's your financial future, you call the shots. What would you like to see? What would you like to do? What would you like to be? What would you like to accomplish? What would you like to establish? I will prove it to you by the scripture. Most people have never seen it that way and you need to see it that way. God wants you to call the right shots. Very important for you and I to understand that these word of God makes a great expression. I'm taking you back to Malachi, the third chapter, if you've got your Bibles. Remember in Malachi, let me set you up with what took place before. We talked about last week, Malachi is a prophet that God is speaking through to the returning captives of Babylon. The children of Israel have been in captivity for 70 years. Can you imagine 70 years in a foreign land? 70 years under the taskmaster of the Babylonian Empire. And now they're allowed to go home to Jerusalem. When they get home in Jerusalem, they start doing the same thing over that got them into captivity in the first place. We're creatures of habit. It doesn't matter what generation you're born in. Whether you were born thousands of years ago or today, it doesn't matter. We're going to have the same issues whether you're a farmer or a technician in the tech industry. It doesn't matter. It's all the issues of the heart. And they kept making mistakes over and over again. And God sends this prophet Malachi to straighten out their mistakes so that they don't go back into captivity. They don't go back into a cursed position again. Oftentimes we don't realize that's them, but we do the same thing today. And what they were doing, if you remember from the first chapter, is that they were offering to the Lord a dishonorable gift to God. Did you know you can offer a, 
gift to God and it be a dishonorable gift to God and not received by God as being good? That's exactly what they did. They looked at their flocks. They saw which one was sick. They saw which one was beggarly. They saw which one was lame. They saw which one couldn't make it and wouldn't live long. They would take the sick, lame one and they would bring him into the temple and offer that which was no good that was going to die to God. And God saw that. And instead of honoring God with the first and the best, they honored God with whatever they had left over. We oftentimes do that in American churches today. We pay all our bills. We do all of our stuff. Whatever we've got left over, we pull the drudge out of our pocket. Whatever we don't need, and we throw it down to God. And God sees that as a token that is dishonorable. And he makes this statement in in Malachi, the first chapter. He says, even the governor of your land wouldn't take those sheep that are broken down and sick. Why do you think God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who deserves a worthy honor, would accept that? And he just scolds them at where they're at. Now, can I just say this to you? This is a learning time for all of us. We're the same type of people they are. Generation after generation after generation will face the same issues, the same problems. That's why the scripture is as good today as it was then. That's why the prophet's words then are just as good today. You know why? You may dress different. You may think different. You may live different. You may eat different. You may do a different thing. But the heart issues of man never changes at all. And until our heart issues change, then nothing we do is any good before God. And this is all about conditioning the heart. I could share with you about giving. You'd all be moved in such a way that you would give. This is not about giving. This is about your heart. I'm not after your money, but I'm after your heart strings for the things of God. And when the things of God have you, instead of them having you, those material things, then you'll give and then you'll get blessed. Is anybody listening? So when I take you to Malachi, the third chapter, it says some fascinating things. Many of you have read them numerous times, but you haven't heard what I'm going to say to you today. And I want you to listen closely. In Malachi, the third chapter, let's take a look, if you will, in verse number eight of Malachi, the third chapter. It starts off with, will a man rob God? I don't know if you understand what he just said. I thought that was an amazing question. And you know the first thing I thought about? I thought to myself, what do you mean will a man rob God? God has everything. God is all-knowing, all-powerful holds the moon in its right axis so the oceans don't flood the land, holds the sun in its right distance so that we don't burn up or freeze. God speaks and the planets exist and the solar systems are hung on his word and he establishes and holds it all together and here we are, these finite little humans walking around this planet and we are going to rob from God? And I thought that was an amazing question. If, if you ever really ask me, can a man rob from God? My natural answer is, of course not. But he answers the question because they were robbing from God. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And that was so interesting. Robbing is such an interesting word and what a hard and harsh word. You see, a lot of times we don't understand what it means. But here's what it means. When I go into your space and get your things and I take your things away from you and I apply them in my life and I use them for my own personal gain, I have now robbed you. A police officer in the last church service came up to me. He said, listen, when you break into someone's house and you steal what they have, that's called burglary. But if you steal something personal from someone, that's called robbery. In other words, God is making a statement that I can break into that which belongs to God. Oh, hear me now. Personally take what he has and use it for my own personal gain. And I now become a violator of his personal assets. And that's called robbery. And God makes this statement. Will a man rob God? Yet you have 
past tense. He's speaking to the people. Notice the capital M on the word me. Talking about God. He says, you have robbed me. You have gone and taken for yourself what belongs to me. You say, in what way have we robbed you? Which is really a fascinating comment. You stop and think about it for a moment. They are so out of it, they didn't even know they were robbing God. Did you know that most people in this room right now have no concept that they might be robbing from God personally that which belongs to God and using it for their own good? And they didn't even have a concept. They weren't even aware. They didn't even know that they were robbing that which belonged to God and using it for themselves. In what way, they say, have you, we robbed you. And he makes a comment and tithe and offerings. A lot of times we don't understand what he means. The word tithe up there means 10% of everything that you gain, God belongs to God, that 10%, and he lets you keep the 90. And then God blesses the 90 and the 90 spends like 140 or 50 or 80, but you only have the 90. Or you can rob God and keep the 100, and it'll be, as you'll see in a moment, cursed. And it'll be like a man with a bag full of holes. In what way have you robbed me in tithe? A tithe means 10% of your gain. Can I just say this to you? Listen to what I'm going to say to you. A lot of people think like this. They said, wait a minute. The tithe came in in the Old Testament law and went out with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know something. That's just plain stupid theology. It came in 430 years before the law was ever introduced and it never stopped from the time of Jesus Christ himself. Even spoke about it numerous times in the New Testament. And it ought to be a beginning place. It's 10%. But if you really knew Old Testament law, you would understand that under the Old Testament, you tell me where you want to be. Under the Old Testament, it really wasn't just 10%. It was really 23%. But today we start with that 10% tithe. How are you, Robin? A woman came up to me the other day and she made this statement. Pastor, I'm going to start tithing. And I said, great. She said, I'm going to start with 2%. I looked at her in the face. I said, that's giving. That's not tithing. There's a difference between giving and tithing. Giving is giving, but tithing is 10%. And you call it giving if it's giving, but call it tithing if it's tithing. Notice how he said, you haven't robbed me and you don't give. Were they giving? Yes. Did they go to the temple? Yes. Did they offer sacrifices? Yes. Did these people believe in God? You bet they believed in God. Then what was wrong with them? What they were doing, they were doing their way instead of God's way, which is a tendency for every generation. We always want to do things our way, the way we think instead of the way he wants us to do them. And he comes along and makes it very clear, you have robbed me when tithe and offerings. Offerings is over and above. Yeah. Then he makes the statement in verse number nine, which is a powerful statement. You're cursed with a curse. Now, wait a minute. You might say to me, Pastor Jim, that's the craziest thing in the world. You know, when you're a Christian, you can't get cursed. Doesn't matter if somebody down the street has one of those little dolls and sticks and pins in it. It won't work for me because I can't curse what's blessed. The Bible says you cannot curse what's blessed. And I am blessed. In fact, you'll find that in the Old Testament. And a bad Old Testament prophet tried to curse Israel. He was hired to curse Israel. And he tried numerous times to curse Israel. He finally came to the conclusion. He said, you know what? I cannot curse what's blessed but I can get them to curse themselves. 
And he brought in that element into the children of Israel and they mingled with that element. And guess what happens? They ended up cursing themselves. What God's saying to us today, the people who rob from God, they're cursed with a curse because they, listen to this, curse themselves, not because God wants to curse them. He doesn't. He wants to bless them. God, not because someone else cursed them. Nobody can curse you. But guess what? You can curse yourself when you do it your way instead of God's way. Is anybody listening in the house of the Lord? I know it's tough. I didn't write this. You are cursed with a curse. Why? For you have robbed me. Notice the capital M on the word me. Even this whole nation, all of you have done it. Whew. Pretty powerful statement. Then it takes us to verse number 10. Verse number 10 is a big verse, but let me talk to you about verse number 10. It's such a big verse, you gotta hear this. This is, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. This, hear me. This is a mind-boggling verse about your freedom. Absolutely bizarre. Let me read it to you and let me explain it to you. Verse number 10 comes along and says, bring all, stop right there. I think it's a tragedy in American churches that people give because some preacher hypes them. If I don't say something about how many people we feed and how many hundreds of thousands of people get all their food and how many mission fields we're in and how many hospitals we're in and how many convalescent hospitals and how many programs are going on in prisons and how we're meeting the needs of people underneath the bridge, oftentimes people won't give until the preacher talks to them about giving and then they decide, well, yes, let's give something. Isn't it sad the American church has to be that way when in fact the Bible says bring that's a completely different attitude of the heart if you can talk me into it preacher I'll give if you have enough programs that sound good to me I'll give and you know if it makes sense to me I'll give if I have it I'll give God never said give because someone talks you into it. I think that's a sad state for any church. I think before you get out of your car and walk in this building, you should have already had your gift and offering ready to go because you're bringing it to the Lord. You say, Pastor, are you gonna stop offering it? No, because if I stop, you'll stop. Isn't that sad? 90% of you wouldn't give anything. How do I know? First three years of the church, I put a basket. I didn't want to be a pastor. I'm making money in business, man. I've got a great business going on. I've got a great future. Mama and me are doing good. We know about giving and we love it because God's just pastoring us back. I don't want to be an old stupid preacher. And I, I put a basket out in the foyer of our church at that time, and I said, God, uh, these people won't give. It'll go broke in this place, and then I can go back to my business. <laughs> God spoke to me and says, you put the money in. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> Three years we paid the bills of this place because people won't give. So you wonder why I'm going to pump the money, say, we do this, we do that. Here's why, because of the people next to you won't give. You might, but they don't. And he comes along and he says, bring all. Somebody, uh, can somebody please define what the word all means? All. What? All. In Spanish. All. <laughs> Swahili? <laughs> Freddie, you're not Swahili. You're Riverside. What are you talking about, man? He, so he says, bring all the tithe and to, into the storehouse. You know what the word storehouse means? It means like grocery store. You know how you go in a grocery store and you get all the needs of your family? You buy the chicken, you buy the meat, you buy the bread, you buy the loaves, you buy the vegetables, you go to the checkout stand, what do you do? You give them money and you walk home, you have all your needs met. And guess what? You don't farm anymore. 
You go to the grocery store. And that's what this is all about. In other words, the church is described as the grocery store. And then he comes along and says that there may be food. And then he describes what the storehouse is like. My house, the church. How do I know that? Bring all your tithes and offerings into the house of God because this is where your family gets fed from spiritually. Is anybody listening? Wait a minute. Someone said to me, wait a minute, you don't understand. I only have so much money and I decided to give my tithe to my sister who has problems. Can I tell you something? That's not a tithe and you're putting it in the wrong place. You do it your way and all of a sudden you're back to the cursed with a curse. When, you're, when you need a marriage in your family, when you need a counseling in your family, when you need to go visit and get pumped up in the things of God, when you need uh, someone to straighten out and answer a problem for you, when you need to go just get rejuvenized in, in the things of God, do you go to your sister's house? I don't think so. A lot of people say, wait a minute, my kids go to Christian school. I'm not against Christian schools. But your tithe doesn't belong in a Christian school. When someone dies in your family, go ask the principal if they'll do the funeral. Doesn't work that way. But there is an offering that he says. Tithes and offering. The tithe, notice how it says this. Bring all your tithe. Didn't say offering. Bring all your tithe. Read it. Doesn't say bring all your offering. You can bring your tithe and your offering into the house of God, but you, for sure the tithe belongs in the house right. where your family and you get fed. Is, is that not true? If you don't, then what happens is you become a robber. What happens? You become one who's cursed. What happens? You find yourself in poverty wondering what happened. Listen, this is God's economic recovery plan for you. Is anybody listening? And then the most bizarre part of this verse comes next. And try, notice the capital M on the word me. And try me now, I love the word now, in this. Now wait a minute. Do you know what God just said? God said as the creator of the heavens and of the earth, the one who speaks and the planets exist. The one that holds the moon, puts the sun up in place. The one who wa has sun walks on water, opens the blind eyes and raises the dead. The one whom no one and nothing can stop. The one who is eternal, king of glory, says, I'm giving you permission to test me. Nowhere else have I ever found, anywhere in the scriptures after 35 years of being a theologian, nowhere else have I ever found anywhere in the scripture where God allows you and me as humans to test him except here. Nowhere. And he says, test me. Try me. In fact, exact opposite. The Bible says, and you know this, you shall not tempt thy Lord God. In other words, you're not to test him in any other area except the one he gives you permission in, and it's in tithes and offerings. Why? Because he knows our heartstrings are tied to our money yep. instead of to him. And he wants to prove something to you. Test me, says the Lord of hosts. Last part of that verse, watch this. If I will not, here comes the very first promise. Can I just say this about promises? He didn't have to make this promise. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that you cannot handle it, my goodness sakes alive, he didn't have to say that. He could have just said, test me and do what I tell you to do because I'm God. But he doesn't. He says, test me and then I'm gonna share with you the abundance results and the abundant results that I promise you if you test me and you do your part, is that I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour you out such a blessing that you will not be able to handle it. Wow, wait a minute. That's more than I could ever imagine. 
He didn't have to say that at all. That's the thing that bothers me the very most. Here's God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. You've got to be kidding. First of all, you don't have to be tested. I need to be tested all the time. He tests us all the time. But here now we're getting permission, the only time to test him. And in what area? Finances. Why? And then he puts a promise on it that he didn't have to do. A promise that says, man, I'm going to open up heaven. Can you imagine when the heaven's windows open, pour you out a blessing that you can't even handle and what it must be like? He promises that. But notice this. He is not a slot machine in the sky. He doesn't say when he's going to do it. So he's going to see how long you do your test. And then when he finally convinced that you're in it from your heart, then the windows start to open. Verse number 11 comes along. Here's the second promise. Wait a minute, he made the first promise pretty good. Here's the second promise. What the heck is that all about? He doesn't have to give me a promise about anything. He's now going to say, test me, and here's the results of the test. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, and that nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. He said, What the heck does that mean? He just means whatever you put your hand to, he will prosper. Whatever business situation, let me give you an illustration. At work, they're laying off people. Guess what? Because you're a tither, you'll not get laid off. And if you do get laid off, God's got a better job. Follow me? Have you ever got a paycheck and said, it's just not enough? I haven't even cashed it. It's already spent. Am I the only one that's ever felt that in my life? Or do I have any kind of a, a, yeah, give me a grunt. Let me know you're there. I got a paycheck. I don't even know where it's going. I haven't even cashed it yet, but I know it's not enough. That's called holes in your bag. You got a money bag and there's holes in it. And it's just, guess what? He says he'll rebuke the devourer. He'll plug up the holes in the bag. Because the 90% that's blessed, hear me now, tithing, the 90% that's blessed will spend like 140, 150, 160%. Is anybody listening? But the 100% when you rob God brings you into a position of being cursed and you wonder why God doesn't bless you. Have you ever said to God, oh God, come on, could a little bit of money from heaven break the bank of heaven? I need a little bit more. And God says, yeah, I need a little bit more from you too. And I need your heart in it instead of just doing it because you're treating me like a slot machine. Is anybody listening? Well, I I think that's a pretty good promise. One, he'll open up the windows of heaven. Two, he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. In other words, there's one wanting to rob your family, rob your children, rob your finances, rob your marriage, rob your kids, rob everything from you. Guess what? He's the devourer. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you what? Life more abundantly. All we have to do is get into Jesus and do things his way. Is anybody listening? Now watch this. Verse 12, wait a minute, one promise was enough. He didn't have to do that. Verse 11, two promises, unbelievable. Here's a third promise, and all the nations call you blessed. In other words, you'll be a testimony for everybody, and they'll notice that you're blessed. In other words, you have to be so outstanding for others to notice. And the way you get outstanding for others to notice is by simply doing what God would have you to do. What you get all belongs to God anyway. Let me say it again. What you get all belongs to God anyway. God gives you everything you'll ever have and you will not take anything with you. Now, in order to keep it so you can have more, you're going to have to do the right things with it in order for you to get blessed. Where he opens up the windows of heaven, he rebukes the devourer, and thirdly, makes you someone who's recognized as someone who is a financial leader and people speak about you and that you're blessed. How in the world does that happen? Because you all go back to tithing and giving offerings. And it comes from the depths of the heart. 
It doesn't come from anything. Now, I made a statement that you can call the shots. I mean, stop thinking about it for a moment. Let's say that you go to a financial advisor and you're going to deposit five or $10,000 in this financial advisor. And the guy looks at you across the desk and he says these words, how much of a return do you want? There is nobody in here that will say, I, I, I don't care, whatever. <laughs> there is nobody in this room right in here that wouldn't say, uh, I'm giving you money to make money for me. I want as much as I can get. And then what if he said to you, in this market, you can get a 2 or 3% return? By the way, for those of you who don't know, that's pretty darn good. Treasury bonds, bonds aren't even close to that. Well, what if I can get you 5% or 6 or 7% every single year, guaranteed by the bank? Don't you love banks that guarantee things? I mean, I think a lot of people would love to have their investment guaranteed by a bank. Do you remember a bank called Security Pacific? How about Washington, what was it? Mutual. Go ahead and let that be your security. I'd much rather have God, creator of the heavens and the earth, that says, try me. Wait a minute, if I do my part, and he fails at his part, he would lose the throne because he now would become a liar. You think God's going to lose the throne over getting you finances that you need to have? I don't think so. But what if you went to that financial advisor and he said, I can get you whatever you think, whatever you're believing for. And you're going, wait a minute, I, I believe we're two, three, four, five hundred percent return. <laughs> and the financial advisor says, no problem. First of all, you'd have him checked out by the whatever. <laughs> He's lost his mind. God's saying the same exact thing. Let's go to the New Testament, this time the words of Jesus. A lot of people don't see it this way, but let's take a look at it in reality, exactly what Jesus is saying. He's going to summarize everything that's been said in Malachi with words that you can simply understand. If you will, go with me to the sixth chapter, verse number 38 of the book of Luke. Gospel of Luke. Let's pop it up on the overhead. Jesus starts out with this word. Give. Didn't say take. Didn't say cheat. Didn't say rob. Didn't say hoard. Didn't say hold back. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Then he describes how it's going to be given unto you. Press down, shaken together. Listen to this. Running over. You ever poured milk in a glass and it just went all over the counter? Because your glass couldn't hold it. That's what he's talking about. In other words, he's opening up the windows of heaven, pouring out so much on you that you can't handle it. A couple said to me yesterday after yesterday's service, I met him out in the foyer by those, uh, those little, uh, what are they called? Information, Information booth. booth, thank you. Young couple, I said, gee, how you guys doing? Great. They said, Pastor, you know, you preached about this 19, uh, no, uh, 2008, 2008. And we didn't have any money. We started tithing. Immediately out of my mouth, I said this to that young couple. Real cute couple. I think they're in their mid-20s. I said, and I'll bet you've been broke since then. They laughed, they both smiled, they said, are you kidding? We are rich today. I mean, we are amazingly got more than we know what to do with. I, 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 the reason I said, and I'll bet you're broke today, because I knew what the answer would be like. Guys, can I tell you something? I don't know how it works. It just works. I don't know how God does it, but he's God. And you curse yourself by shelling God short. Selling God short means you didn't stay in there with the investment and you sold it, not to the end. Given it shall be given unto you, man, it's going to be running over. And he'll put it into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it'll be measured back to you. 
Let me say it again. For the same measure that you use, whatever measuring, what kind of a measuring stick do you use? Will it be measured back to you? Talking about quantity now. Let me say it again. Remember, you call the shots. You're before the investment counselor of the universe. For the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you in that same measurement. So if I give to God and I have a spoon, which most people have, and I give to God, God says, I will measure it back with a spoon. I don't want the spoon back, God. <laughs> a spoon back isn't going to help me. I need a lot more than a spoon. But the problem with it is you called the shot. You gave to God with the spoon, and God's tied to his word, and he has to give back to you with the same measurement. Follow me. So instead of having the little spoon, I finally go to church and learn something about how to do this. And um, I, I, I get a bigger spoon out. And I give to God. And God says, good. I'll give it back to you. I don't need the spoon. How do I get across from you? I need a lot more than the spoon. But I can't do anything because you're only given in the spoon. So. <laughs> I'm calling the shots. And I'm putting you to the test. Now I'm given a lot. And I'm getting a shovel full back. Have you ever noticed when you get a shovel full you want to wish you had a bigger shovel. <laughs> whatever measure, whatever measure, your call. Now wait a minute. I was on my job site the other day. I was on my job site, and I was looking at this front end loader. Let me show you a picture of it. I need the loader return. I can do this, it's real easy. Doesn't cost me anything. I can fit that in my budget. This is, well, shh. You know, I'll brag about that, but still not enough. But that, but where'd it go? There it is. <laughs> Debbie had a picture of me in front of that. I'll tell you something, that's about four yards, not a shovel full. That's a big, big puppy. Point being is this. With whatever, put the verse back up. With whatever you do, you call the shots. For with the same measure that you use it, it'll be measured back to you. We have this campaign to pay this church off. It isn't going to get done no matter how many people go to this church until you get it in your heart to do a loader. But God, I don't feel bad about asking you because God said, test me. And if he doesn't give it back to you in greater measure, he's not God. And you know he's not losing the throne over your finances. I want you to watch this video. We'll conclude with this. Check it out. The day we went in, uh, went into labor, my, uh, Robin was actually induced. And then the following morning, um, we were able to go back into the NICU. 
And that's when uh, the doctor said, if we've ever heard of Down syndrome. And I just remember crying and just not understanding why. And Pastor Jim said, you know, what you do from this very moment in your lives, whether you run with God or you run from God, it will determine basically the rest of your life, what you do right now. You know, before Ryan was born, we didn't have really any money. We um, barely made it every single month. Once Ryan came in and I saw what was going to entail and how our lives were going to change, I literally told God, God, as far as finances go, you figure it out. You know, I don't even care. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I don't have time. I'm dealing with, with Ryan and taking care of the family. And I think at that point is where it was truly given to God, where it was like I had something so much more important to worry about that I don't even have to even think about finances anymore. Over the course of, of Ryan being born, um, my finances have increased month over month. It is just because of being faithful with tithing, tithing and offering and having the right heart behind it now too and truly giving it to God. One day you just have to wake up and you have to make a choice. Am I actually going to do this or am I not? It's just really funny how God can take someone that can be an ungrateful giver and still give him the opportunity to do something amazing, you know, with, with, with finances. Amazing. Someone said, well, I need to prepare for tithing. You never prepare for tithing. You just do it. It's never a preparation. It's never. You can't prepare. You just do it. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave, so listen closely. I want you to answer this question. Nobody will know the answer but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building, hey, 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 listen. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped and you died. Bang! You're dead. Would you go to heaven? Here's the question. Or would you go to hell? Now, why do you answer the question the way that you answer it? That's a good question in itself. Some of you may have said, well, I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'm going to go. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. Some of you said, well, I hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. Some of you said, well, you know, Pastor, I, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold on, hold on. My mom and dad told me when I was a kid, I was a Christian. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby, put a cross, St. Christopher around my neck. Went to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Can I tell you something? Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you and put a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. You're not going to make it. You're going to die and you're going to go to hell. And I don't want you to do that, and you don't want to do that, so let's get right with God. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way but his way. And he makes this statement. He says these words that are so incredibly powerful in John 3rd chapter. You must be born again. Bottom line, born again means something, and most people that attend American churches don't know what it means, but let me tell you what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Bottom line, all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a rude, crude statement. From the mouth of Jesus, what an in-your-face statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Jeez. Here's what he really meant by that statement. He means that people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. Can I tell you that? 
Lukewarm, may I share with you what it means? Lukewarm means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, here's what it means. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. <laughs> That's lukewarm. And lukewarm people, according to the words of Jesus, are not going to make it. And somebody, somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it unless you do things God's way. And in order for you to be born again, you're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. I emphasize the word give because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. I emphasize the word give because he's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do this. Just like with giving, it's got to be something that comes from your heart. If it comes from a system, it doesn't work. If it comes from traditions or religious rituals, it doesn't work. It's got to come from the heart. And when you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life, you're making a statement. Your statement is, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be a child of God and enter into the blessings of the Lord. And today I want you to know God wants to bless you. But some of you that are in this room need to get right with God. So let's talk. How do you do it? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it. I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Now listen closely. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head or you wouldn't be here. I already know you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. Knowing who Jesus is, the devil knows who Jesus is. He's not a Christian going to heaven. This is about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? <clears throat> today, it's your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, I'm asking you to raise your hand. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed, man. Yep, you will be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Come on. No one's that stupid. Don't let the devil talk you into it. Today is your day of salvation. And today, you're going to have to do something his way to get right with God by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. I've told you the truth. I've done my job. Now, today, I can't make you do anything. But, oh, the Spirit of God wants you to, and you know it. Listen to God and get ready to pop your hand up. All across this auditorium, I'm counting to three, and I pile my hands together. You get your hand up and then put it right back down. Are you ready? Here it is. One. Two, three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, thank you, nine, thank you, 10, thank you, 11, 12, thank you, back over here. And this side, over here, I didn't see anybody, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, thank you, 20, thank you. God bless you, anybody else? In the foyer, ushers turn around, in the foyer, there's another one back there, 21, 22, thank you. On this far side, there's some more people back here. Thank you. Two more in the family room, 22, 23. Another person, 24. I'm not sure if I already counted you, but I'll, I love numbers, so I'll count you again. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 24. Where are you, 25? Can you just feel there's got to be one more? Of course there is. Thank you, 25. God bless you back here, 26, 27. Thank you. God bless you. What do you say? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27 people. Isn't God good? Here's what I want you to do. All 27 of you, I want you to do something. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. I'll let you go in just a moment. All 27 of you, raise your hand. You're serious about God. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. If you didn't raise your hand, <laughs> and you should have, you can come too. Now, did you hear what I just said? So check with your neighbor. Give him an elbow and say, come on, I'll go with you. You need to go. 
I said that the other day to Deborah. She said, I'll go if you go. No, no, she didn't, she didn't. So here's what you need to do, is you need to get your stuff, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come, 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 come. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. And I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Come on, come on home. Lord, have your Come on home. Come on home. Oh, they're coming. Come on home. And I'll live for Come on home. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand. They're still coming. Oh, they're still coming. They're still coming. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? All of you in front, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you over here? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird stuff. Going to pray with you, number one. Two, give you some free information about what to do next now that you're a Christian. And three, introduce you to a program we have to help you get strong as a Christian. You don't want to go back falling through the cracks, doing the old stuff you used to do. Let us help you go on with Jesus. If you'll make one year commitment to Jesus and this church, I'm telling you, you got saved in this church. If you'll make a commitment to Jesus in this church for one year, the rest of the life that you live will be blessed out of your socks. And don't tell me you don't want it. We'll help you get there. We'll help you make it work. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.